Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Anaheim Public Library is so pleased to present this series on the power of images. Our host is me, but the, perf the main guy who's doing everything is Dr. Frederick Gooding Jr. He's a author, he's a university professor, and uh, he's covered a lot of territory with us over the past few months. We've covered uh, Race at the Movies. His book, Black Oscars, um, was really impressive for showing the uh, historical trends and impact on audience uh, with um, basically showing how racial patterns have existed over time, haven't changed as much as, um, as life has, I guess. Uh, in March, we talked about race and sports, and uh, we talked about is it a true meritocracy uh, or not? And uh, the book, You Mean There's Race in My Sports by Dr. G provided a framework for that discussion. Uh, presentation last month in April was on the genius of hip hop and uh, talking about the uh, music that um, can sometimes be marginalized and how instead it's, it's an agent of change. And so today, as our uh, concluding part in this series, um, Power of Image, Dr. G is gonna share with us uh, his swan song wild card option. Dr. G, what do you have for us this evening? Well, thank you for the introduction, Joe, and I'm so very glad that you asked because <laughs> <laughs> I am so very pleased and uh, tickled to share with you all uh, something that um, is the product of um, in, in, um, you know, some exciting research. So I'm giving you a preview, actually, a sneak preview uh, to something that is in development, it's in the works. I have been fortunate to have been named one of two. Uh, I'm gonna put it in the chat there. Uh, but I've been uh, fortunate to be named one of two uh, visiting senior scholars at the National Gallery of Art this summer. Yes, one of two nationwide. And um, so the National Gallery of Art, as you might imagine, is in Washington, D.C., okay, as a national, right? And so um, as, is a, as a visiting senior fellow, I'm going to be studying statues, black statues, right? And essentially, I'm going to be studying what they stand to tell us about race within our capital space. So I'm going to give you a little preview about some of the ideas that I, I was formulating in terms of when I made my proposal. I'm going to go this summer to actually do the research on the ground and find out what, what I can, see if I can't put it in a book format. And hopefully this will give me uh, the perfect excuse to come back to Anaheim Library System and talk some more, you know, once I actually have another published book in hand, right? Sounds but, um, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, very good. Okay, so, so I'm glad we're excited. And, and what, what actually got me started on this was, uh, believe it or not, y'all, it was a month ago. I mean, not a month, a year ago, when we were having these conversations about why would an officer uh, continue to hold his knee upon the neck of an unarmed, uh, handcuffed individual who's laying prostrate on his stomach. Uh, why would he do this for you know eight minutes and forty six seconds, right? I mean, because you figure after I don't know three minutes and forty six seconds, uh, if he got up off his knee, the individual would still be handcuffed. If after maybe four minutes and forty six seconds he got up off his knee, the individual would still be unarmed. After five minutes and forty six seconds, if he gets up off his knee the police officer still has the badge. If he gets up after six minutes and 46 seconds, he gets up off his knee, he still has the gun, right? So in other words, I mean, I, you know, people like me are still processing. I'm, I'm still trying to understand, you know, if you have the gun, you have the badge, you're, you're still in power and control. The individual you're dealing with is still unarmed, still handcuffed and still lying on their stomach. I mean, what, 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 what's so hard about just getting off your knee? Right, because you know, again, I'm not talking about the Dante Wright scenario, whereby an officer, um, trained officer, uh, mistook their taser gu gun for the taser, taser for the gun. I I'm, I'm not sure which, but the idea is that not after 26 days in the force, not after 26 weeks in the force. That's like you know, like four and a half months. Not not after 26 months on the force, right? But after 26 years on the force, you mistake your taser for your gun. And, and so now a 20 year old individual is no longer with us. And all I'm gonna say is this, 
oh, well, he shouldn't have been trying to get into his car and this, that, and that. You know, and, and maybe you're right. Maybe you all have a point in that he should not have been trying to resist the officer and get back into his car. Here's my problem. I have two problems, actually. One of my problems is I watch too much TV, right? Meaning that, you know, I've been crowded. I don't want to say poisoned, but I've been crowded or inspired by images of white males who take charge, do things their way, uh, rebuke the law, rebuff the law. Uh, you know, I mean, they actually, it's like, it's like entertainment, like cops and, and shows of this nature, <clears throat> you know, where um, people will get belligerent, loud, angry, or run away from the cops, and no one ends up dead, is the point. No one ends up dead, right? Um, and also, the second problem I have is I have too many white friends. So what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is that my white friends, you know, I'll go over to homes, <clears throat> you know, we'll um, have some grilled asparagus or something in that nature, then we'll go outside in the back and, um, you know, they'll, they'll light the fire, fire pit, you know, this is something that a lot of my, you know, white colleagues like to do, they'll, they'll, light, they'll light the fire pit and then, you know, we'll, we'll have a couple gluten-free beers and, and, and they'll tell me, like, their stories, right? They'll, that's the problem, I have friends, I mean, they'll tell me their stories and they'll tell me about, oh, one time, you know, we had a little bit too much and we did this, we did that, the cops showed up and it was ha ha he he and they let us go. So let's, they'll tell me these stories. Joe. And so I get confused because, you know, when I look at Dante Wright, I mean, what he did is Taco Bell mild compared to the ghost pepper type of nonsense that some of my white colleagues have gotten into, right? You know, and even just as a university professor, um, I could tell you stories that would make your hair stand up, you know, um, and do a backflip, you know, and then come back down in terms of just on a regular Thursday night, the things that some of these frat bros do. And no one ends up dead is the point. Okay, so what's the point? The point is that last year around this time, we were having all these new conversations, right? It's about inflection point and being woke and, and, and a lot. And part of this conversation was this idea of taking down statues, okay? You know, and I'm referring mostly to Confederate statues. So that was the conversation. Let's take down the Confederate statues like, oh, this Robert E. Lee statue that's been sitting here all this time, maybe we should look at it again, right? Let's take it down. And so there's been a lot of debate about that as far as history versus heritage. Do you just take something down or not? Um, my point here today, um, I'm not here to necessarily answer all those questions. I think many are valid in terms of debate, but what I'm here to talk about today is, it's just got me thinking, well, if we're taking down statues, what statues remain? Right, you know, and particularly when it comes to uh, the image, we talk about the image project. What images have stood the test of time in terms of on a statute level, right? When it comes to African Americans, so I just thought it might be an, another neat way of which to approach this conversation about the value and visibility of African Americans within society, right? That's great. So, yeah. And so, you know, they, they thought so too. And so uh, for at least a couple months this summer, uh, I'll, I'll be out there, uh, you know, with access to all, all the resources to hopefully be able to put together a compelling story. And so um, let, let me just share with you a couple of thoughts and then maybe, maybe, you know, if we have a couple of questions, we can take them and, and kind of go from there. So when we talk about statues, right? Um, I'm, I'm actually fascinated by this concept, because I think it's, it's one of these pieces that we kind of take for granted. You know, you go for a jog in a park, you see a statue, you just run right by it. You know, you're on a college campus, you know, the statue, you kind of just walk right by it. You know, or before you go into a, a maybe a, a sporting arena, you know, there's like a statue usually out front of some, you know, past player, you just kind of walk right by it. But I, I want to just, just kind of like pause and reflect on what statues actually mean for us, right? Because if we wanted to erect the statue next week, like, like, how would that work? Like, can we just erect the statue next Tuesday? You know, the answer is kind of sort of no, right? There's a lot of steps that actually have to take place before we can erect the statue next Tuesday. Um, in fact, there's so many steps, it's not being erected next Tuesday. <laughs> I mean, you know, we'll be lucky if it's erected next year you know, uh, for, from, from next Tuesday, we'll, we'll be lucky, right? You know, because there's a lot of steps that have to take place. And I think we often overlook that. And that's what I would kind of want to focus in on as far as what those steps, what they communicate to us. So 
before we get to those steps in detail, let's just, just warm things up a little bit. So. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure many viewers or listeners might be able to recognize this statue. It is indeed a real statue. Um, it was indeed erected at this location and it actually still exists. I mean, it's not located where it is right now, um, but, it, but it still exists. And this statue is none other then of, you can see on your right-hand side, Rocky Balboa. Now, is Rocky Balboa, I guess, who is Rocky Balboa? I mean, right? I mean, I guess that's the question. Who is Rocky Balboa? Hmm. According to my recollection, Rocky Balboa is a boxer, right? A boxer. But the little detail is he's a real boxer or a fictional boxer? He's a fictional boxer. So this is fascinating. Let's rewind for a little bit. For those of us who were somehow on the dark side of the moon, never heard of this movie, um, this is from the series Rocky, right? Um, First came out in 79, Sylvester starring Sylvester Stallone, uh, which featured the city of Philadelphia as a character, you know, in the movie as well. It kind of represented like the hard nose, like blue collar, tough work ethic, like never say die, not gonna give up type deal. So that's, um, um, you know, this this is actually, uh, you know, the, the parkway, what we call in Philadelphia. And, and this statute is located at the top of the art museum steps. These are the steps that he famously ran up towards the end of the movie when he was training. And for a limited period of time, they actually erected a statue. Um, they actually had a statue located at the top of the stairs. It was actually part of, I think, Rocky IV movie when they, they erected it, you know, in his honor when he was had, we had to fight Avon Drago. But then it was like one thing led to another and they kind of just kept it up there for a limited period of time. But here's the deal. The statue still exists. And it's still in Philadelphia on a parkway. It's just that, okay, based upon our perspective right now, we're, we're look, looking out at the parkway, you know, um, it's actually down, it's at the base of the stairs to your left, right? It, you know, so it's kind of like in the bushes, but it still is erected, it still exists. It's not like, you know, they put it back in some back left studio in Hollywood. So it's at the base of the stairs to the left, it's still there. And, and obviously it's like a tourist attraction. A lot of people take their photos. But I just thought it was just so fascinating that we actually have a statute of a fictional, fictional movie character. And like, you know, what, what does this mean? I mean, you know, this idea is that, you know, it was erected because, and, and, and it stayed in place for so long because of what it symbolized, right? You know, there's this fighting spirit, this never they say, say die attitude. And so many people were able to resonate with the symbology of this statue, right? Um, you know, and again, you know, various genders, even if, you know, I mean, that wasn't your gender, so many people still were able to associate with the symbology of the statue, right? And it became like this powerful image. You know, in fact, uh, I, I live in Fort Worth, Texas right now, because I teach at Texas Christian University. And um, the gym that I go to, believe it or not, has a poster of Rocky inside the gym, right? You know, with, the, with his arms raised at the top of the, at the art museum steps, right? It's, it's, like a, it's like a thing, it's like a thing. You know, it represents something, you know, a statue, right? So there's, there's representative power in a statue, right? You know, that, that we often times, you know, overlook. And I think what is so very powerful about this one is that maybe, there's a sense of more community involvement because typically many statutes are kind of just there and you kind of just happen upon them and you really didn't have a say into like how they came up to be. But the idea that so many people liked the movie and voiced it and talked about it, you know, locally, I think there's a sense of local investment, which makes this statue so special. But in general, the question is how are statutes actually erected in our society? 
you know, if they reflect our society, right? Oh, and, and so here's the picture of where he actually is located now, right? You know, in, in actuality. But it's just, again, it's fascinating. This idea that it's a fictional, not, not, not a real life person, but a fictional individual. So isn't it though kind of unique about statues as opposed to other art forms that, that they actually do represent, um, like you were saying, an ethos, like a, a philosophical, like, you know, Greek statuary, uh, people would have that to remind themselves of different virtues or, or whatever they admire. And so it doesn't surprise me at all that Philadelphia would, would call Rocky Balboa the gritty, you know, the underdog who, who just makes it happen by sheer will, you know, just determination and all of that. So is that something that is any part of what you're looking at when you're talking about, you know, looking at these statues and what they embody and what they're, what they're meant to represent? Do you anticipate that you're going to find that they are representative, not just of, I don't know, people and places and times, but of values, maybe virtues, maybe um, ideals? Absolutely, 100%. Because here, here's what's so fascinating. Um, statutes are significant investments, Joe, of time, money, and energy. Significant investments. You know, and as I was alluding to with the whole, are we gonna put up a statute next Tuesday? Um, because they are expensive in terms, you know, as far as collecting the funds to, to put these up, um, you know, these statutes, um, you know, because remember, think about the material, they're, they're literally, built to last. That's the whole point. This is so important to us that we don't want this to be a temporary display that fades away the next time it rains. No, I mean, the point is this is built to last. This is how important this is to us. Whether, and again, statues can represent ideas or ideals, right? You know, in terms of, you know, maybe it's Lady Liberty, right? Statue of Liberty, right? You know, so it's this larger concept that we want to preserve, you know, versus an actual individual like, oh, like, you know, of course, we have to have a, a statue of William Penn, you know, on top of the, you know, the city hall in Pennsylvania, you know, he helped start the city, you know, it, it depends, you know, it, you know, and, and the, the whole state is named after him, like, we want to remember this individual, right, you know, and so the question is, when it comes to African Americans, mm -hmm. how do they fit into this equation whereby we have decided that this individual is important. Well, the question is, well, who's we, right? You know, who, who's the we that's deciding that this individual is important enough for us to memorialize in perpetuity? And then the question is, how do we memorialize them? Where do we memorialize them, right? Just even the right. location is, 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 is also part of this political message. Is it in the center of town? Is it on top of a building? You know, is it just, you know, on the, in the side, you know, some obscure part of a park, you know? yeah. All this is all part and parcel of you know this 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 idea of messaging you know and you know representative worth, right? And what what I'm suggesting to you is is that so far from what I've seen preliminarily, and this is why I want to research um, in more detail this summer, is that um, nationwide uh, we do have statues of African Americans, but not at the same level of degree. And um, and if we take out Dr. Martin Luther King of the equation <laughs> that significantly reduces the number of statues left of just quote unquote regular people. And then out of that subset, if we take out uh, anyone who's an entertainer or athlete, uh-oh, uh-oh, then that number goes down even more so, right? So you will find statues of black people, like for example, of Michael Jordan in front of the, uh, the United Center in Chicago or of, you know, uh, you know, Shaquille O'Neal, you know, outside of the Staples Center, right? Because, you know, these are athletes and, you know, we admire them for their prowess. But the flip side, Joe, is, you know, to not get too technical is, it's a term what we call romantic racialism. Absolutely. Whereby, you know, we love the black body, we appreciate the black body so long as it's performing and entertaining us because that means we're still in a position of power and control. So, so long as LeBron James catches that ball up in midair and dunks that thing, as on the alley oop, that is, man, that is amazing. We love LeBron James. He can dunk that ball at nobody's business. But the minute he wears a t-shirt that says, I can't breathe, uh, what are you doing? Now all of a sudden it's time for him to shut up and dribble. And that's literally what Laura Ingram said to him, right? And as a response, 
he came up with a series uh, called Shut Up and Dribble as a way to, you know, try to take away some of that, that negative power. But I mean, but literally, I mean, can you imagine how inflammatory it would be if he, if he had told her as a female, why don't you shut up and stay in the kitchen? Right. I mean, you know, I mean, yeah. his, his career would have been over, right. You know, you know, in terms of how he would have been excoriated. Laura Ingram's still in the air. Right. But the, the, the minute that he goes outside of his basketball frame, he's told to shut up and dribble. And so I think what's fascinating is outside of the sports entertainment complex, outside of anyone named Dr. Martin Luther King or Harriet Tubman, right? Just to what degree are we recognizing African-Americans as a part of our society? Right, just, just, you know, because, I mean, I mean, if we think about it, we don't think about it, how there's statutes, uh, you know, on your college campus or in town of just philanthropists, engineers, entrepreneurs, educators, they're just people, but we respect them, we appreciate them, but there's something else that has to happen usually if we're going to recognize an African American individual. It's like some, something extra to get us over that hump, right? Which I find fascinating. And so along those same lines, um, just you know, to keep it at home, I work at Texas Christian University, and that's in Fort Worth, Texas. And this here is a statue of the founders. Within the last year, this statute has become more controversial, and I'll explain why. Many people are calling this a Confederate statute, and that's actually historically inaccurate, okay? Um, so Confederate statutes were erected, most of them, right? Uh, last count, I think the number has been around like 825 total um, memorials and Confederate uh, monuments that have been erected across our country. Um, but most of them were erected during the period of 1900 to 1940. That's when most of them were erected, okay? So not too long after the failed reconstruction period. So Civil War ends in 65, reconstruction lasts only for about 12 years or so. And then you have this idea of, well, what are we going to do? Many Southern states were so desperate to maintain the quote unquote social order they had in the South you know, during the era of enslavement that they um, were very much keen to using Confederate memorials as a way to symbolize and profess this idea of power. And so not in all, but in many cases, many of those Confederate monuments were literally designed to intimidate. They were meant to be big. They were, they usually had expressed and explicit connections to the Confederacy with respect to insignia or uniforms or military arms or what have you. And United Daughters of the Confederacy are responsible for nearly half, right? They put up roughly 400 monuments, the United Daughters. Are, they raised the money and put up 400 monuments. And the idea was they, they wanted to support what we call the lost cause or a perspective that remembers the Civil War in a manner most sympathetic to the Confederate, Confederacy, right? So going back to Texas Christian University, our controversy is that these, this is a statute of two brothers, our founders, Addison and Randolph Clark. They themselves did not own any slaves, their father did, their father did, right? Not a whole lot, but their father did. And Addison Clark actually enlisted and joined the Civil War and actually rose to officer level. His brother Randolph felt compelled to take up arms because it was one of those deals where if he didn't, he was very fearful that his neighbors were going to turn against him, you know, because he was not helping to defend home turf. So he reluctantly joined his brother, but what that does for us now is it creates this conundrum. And so um, many people in the aftermath of George Floyd's murder, we talked about at the top of the hour, um, have been saying that this is a Confederate statute. That's actually not accurate because there's nothing, if you look at the statute, do walk around it you know, twice, 720 degrees, there's nothing that ties this expressly, explicitly, or even indirectly to the Confederacy. It was actually erected in 1993, and it's called the Founder Statute. It was just to honor the people who created TCU. So while it's not a Confederate statute, it is a statute of two individuals who have Confederate ties. That's a fact. And so the point is this. Even years after these two people were alive, years after it was erected, 
we still are having contestable and controversial conversations about symbology. What does it mean? What should we tell students when they first come on campus? It's still a live issue, right? As far as, so in other words, what we, you know, when we talk about these statues, I think what's fascinating is even though we build them to be permanent and, and this idea that they'll stand forever, we often overlook how society is constantly changing around the statue and how we look at it might change, you know, based upon what information we have, right? So how they looked at it in 1994 might be different from how we're looking at it in 2024 based upon what we know now, right? And so what, what do we do? What do we do? Fascinating conversation. So speaking of statutes, um, some people have taken some quite clever, creative and extraordinary measures to prompt us to think about what an image means. Have you seen this before, Joe? Have you seen I this? have. I was, I was trying desperately to remember the uh, sculptor's name, but I, I can't remember her name. Uh, his, his, I think his, his name is Kehinde Wiley. Okay. Yeah. And this was first erected in uh, Times Square, mm -hmm. New York, New York City. And this is actually meant to be a, uh, th th does this look familiar? Does this look like a familiar pose that you've seen before? <laughs> it wouldn't be a traditional one, would it? Well, how about, this is very reminiscent of General Lee's pose on his monument on Monument Row in Richmond, Virginia. Oh, it is, okay. Yeah, and so that, that's one of the more famous uh, epicenters, shall we say, of Confederate uh, monuments. Um, it's called Monument Row, Richmond, Virginia. And um, there's like, I wanna say what, four or five statues, I mean, that, you know, all lined up. And at the end of this Monument Row, you have this huge, massive uh, stone plinth um, upon which on top is erected um, the horse. And the horse represents power, right? You know, literally horsepower. And then the fact that the individual sitting, because it's not just him just standing on his own two feet, right? You know, um, you know, it's not like he's standing, holding, you know, his, his, his uh, poodle, you know, you know, no, no, th that's not how we're going to remember you forever. No, he's on top of a horse, leg raised. That's the symbol of power, right? Not only is he controlling the horse, but he's controlling everybody who's looking at him. Like he is literally on, on, riding on high. He's on, he's in, he's in charge, right? It's, it's power. Absolutely. You're, I mean, you, you're, it's literally built for you to look up. Yeah, I mean, you're not looking, I mean, you're literally, it's built for you to look up and marvel, right? And um, they're also, uh, to their credit, they included uh, half a statue of Arthur Ashe because he's from Richmond, Virginia. And that's at the end of Monument Row. That was controversial as well because A, it wasn't a full statute. Um, it was a half statue. And then it's like kind of random. It's like, you have all these Confederate generals and you know, and whatnot, and then you have Arthur Ashe. <laughs> like, like, what? Like, like, like what? Like, what, what's the connection? Like, oh, they're all from Richmond, I, I guess, I guess. So yeah, that was kind of controversial. Um, but this was prompting a lot of what we call cognitive dissonance. For a lot of people who saw this, you know, you know, in Times Square, like, what, what is this? This has to be a joke, right? And, 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 and it started off that way in terms of he wanted to attract people's attention, right? Because uh, what was fascinating is how so many people would just drive by, uh, you know, Lee Statue, Monument Row, you know, no, no, no protests, no phone calls. But yet, when, when this was put up in Times Square, all, all of a sudden, you know, just, just the floodgates opened up like, wait, what's going on? Wait, what, what is this? And how long is this going to be here? And what's, who is this? And who put this up? All these questions, like, just came out of the world. So in other words, all of a sudden, people noticed. Interesting. All of a sudden, people noticed. The minute that you have a symbol that interrupts that visual narrative that we take for granted, all of a sudden, people notice. Because uh, on purpose, he put a black male with dreadlocks, right? So it's not close shaven, you know, hair like LeBron James, but, but this idea of dreadlocks as in, you know, symbolizing this idea of uh, I'm not afraid to let you see my culture right? or an aspect of my culture. He's also wearing a hoodie. It's kind of hard to see, but he's wearing a hoodie. And we all know that hoodies can be worn by billionaires like Mark Zuckerberg, but not by teenagers with Skittles and iced tea in their hand like Trayvon Martin, right? Yeah. Hoodie didn't work for Trayvon Martin. No. And so this 
is not Times Square, as you can tell in the background underneath the horse's foot. Uh, this is actually Richmond, Virginia. Um, what began as a temporary installment, because it generated so much you know, uh, interest and controversy, um, in the aftermath, actually, of uh, you know, uh, the, the, woke, the new woke movement, the suggestion was floated and somehow you know, it, it carried where they, they, they decided to move it from this temporary location in uh, Times Square, actually to Richmond, Virginia, where it's oh. supposed to be permanently installed now, right? You know, and so that, that's a part of that narrative. And also when you look at the, um, the base or the plinth of the Robert E. Lee statue, you'll notice that there's a lot of, shall we say, graffiti art at the base. And um, that's part of um, it becoming transformed into what we call a, a living monument now, right? Whereby people are now interacting and um, you know, expressing themselves on the base of the monument. And um, you know, again, uh, there's all types of opinions being expressed, you know, either in favor or against. But um, I think there's something to be said about the healthy exchange of ideas in one common space, right? Where normally it's so very difficult for us to come together and share ideas because uh, the way things are wired now, I mean, I, I can be on my phone all day long and only hear myself in the echo chamber. I can only hear people who think the way I do and, and, and echo what, what I think, as opposed to me having been challenged to think critically, right? And so, right, uh, Rumors of War by uh, Kendi Wiley, right, is, is the name of the, um, the author. The, right, and so this is the original, as you see, stylized in that image, right, looking out, right? Um, and uh, I don't know, how many horses have their tails that straight or erect, but that, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. So I just, oh, oops, just to give you the, uh, you know, the, the, the contrast of what it looked like when it was in Times Square, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, and so this was created um, back in 1907, um, right? Okay, so speaking of statues, this here is none other than our dreamer from Georgia, right? Um, none other than Dr. Martin Luther King. And this is located in Washington, DC, actually. And this statue is quite large, it's 30 foot in height. Uh, and it has the distinction of being the only statue in uh, the Washington Mall of a non white individual. the only one. I mean, and I think what's so fascinating is, is that while um, all the statutes as you see are impressive, I mean, Jeff Jefferson Memorial is impressive, obviously the Lincoln Memorial is impressive. Um, and in fact, the Lincoln Memorial, um, you know, is, is designed actually, you know, in, in the image of Acropolis, right? You know, the high temple, you know, I mean, you know, with the columns, uh, you know, this is literally how it's designed. It's designed to show our power. I mean, this is the center of our government. I mean, you know, so with so many people from our country or from the, you know, internationally, the globe coming to visit the center of our power, the idea is we want to put our best foot forward, right? And what better way to symbolize power but by stylizing it in a way that commands respect? So if you want to see Lincoln, you need to walk up the stairs and see this larger than life image. I mean, Joe, have you seen it in person? No, I haven't yet. Well, I mean, you, you've seen enough on TV, it's impressive. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's like, whoa, I mean, it's like it's like a thing. I mean, I'm sure when you go, it was probably on your list. Oh, let's go see the Lincoln Memorial. <laughs> if, you, if you've ever been, it's probably gonna be on your list. Of like, I gotta go see it. And let's not overlook the obelisk, you know, in the center, right, between the Capitol and the Lincoln Memorial, because it's a long walk, believe it or not. It's, it will take you the better part of half a day, you know, um, you know, to walk from the Lincoln Memorial all the way to the Capitol. Um, and, you know, because you have to stop along the way, you can see the Vietnam Memorial, um, you can see the World War II Memorial, I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot to see along the way. Um, but the point is that, let's not forget how the obelisk is actually, do you know where the obelisk comes from? Like, I, I want to say Egypt, but I'm not that's positive. That's correct, that's correct, that's correct, Egypt in my background, and it's a symbol of power as in fertility, I'll, I'll leave it to your imagination, Right. how, how that came about, right? right. Okay, but, but no, but seriously, I mean, this idea that, you know, um, it's like, I think one of the largest freestanding, you know, pieces of masonry, uh, you know, at least in our country, if not the world. And so this, this is just showing people that, hey, we, we mean business, right? You know, we respect our leaders. So the fact that they included Dr. Martin Luther King 
um, is fascinating, right? First of all, they already included Dr. King to a degree in that, Joe, next time you go to the Lincoln Memorial, if you look very carefully, it's not centered. I don't know why it's not. It's not centered. But there's actually a small little plaque um, you know, halfway up the stairs that says, you know, what, August 28th, you know, uh, 1963, uh, Dr. King gave I Have the Dream speech, right? I mean, I mean, think about like how many performances have been on the uh, Lincoln Memorial steps. I mean, how many people have been there? And even before they put in the statue, there's this idea of they wanted to recognize like this pivotal moment in time, this like defining moment in time, you know, that um, the world will forever remember America by, you know, that I have a dream speech. Like, so they acknowledged him already with the plaque, I think, which is fascinating. But then this idea of, you know what, he's so important, we're actually gonna, you know, actually honor him with the monument. But even still, you know, what I wanna study is this idea that it's just not as simple as it looks. First of all, the government um, approved the land, but they didn't really lend any resources. And so when I talk about how you and I can't put up a statue next Tuesday, this is part and parcel of proof because it took years. He's a member of a, a fraternity, a black fraternity, uh, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. And they took the lead largely in raising the funds necessary to create the monument. So the government said, okay, well, we'll give you the land, we'll give you the authority. And that took you know, a, a long time to go through all those hoops, you know, get that approval. Remember, this is the national freaking mall. You, know, you, yeah. don't, you don't just put something up there. You know, I mean, it's the national mall. So everyone had to sign off on this. And you know, remember, I mean, it wasn't until, what, two decades after he died that you know, it became a holiday and even Arizona was holding out you know, for the longest time until, until the 80s or 90s, right? So even, even that wasn't a done deal. But even still, the government said, you have the land, but you need to find the money, right? And so while we fund bridges to nowhere, you know, we did not fund this. And so they had to take it upon themselves to raise funds, and that took, that took years, took years to do. And then what's fascinating is, um, you know, even in, in doing so in crafting up the image, you know, they actually had to go back and revise because they felt that, because at first he had like a, a more furrowed brow, right? Hmm. He, he, had, he had, more, had more of a look of concern. Yeah. They felt that was too militant. Hmm. I mean, this is Dr. King, like Mr. Peace, right? That is an I study from Gandhi, right? You know, nonviolence. And they felt, so it's just this idea of the power of image and symbology, like even a furrowed brow was deemed to be too much, right? And this is Dr. King we're talking about, right? So, I think it raises questions as to, well, what do we want to symbolize? Do we want to symbolize the truth or do we want to symbolize that which makes us feel better you know, about the truth, right? You know, because arguably, um, you know, when you look at Thomas Jefferson, we can say that the record is not complete. Um, you know, because Joe, you're, you're familiar with Sally Hemings, right? You know who yep. Sally Hemings is? Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people don't know who Sally Hemings is. Um, and just for the record, for those watching or listening, Sally Hemings is um, one of his concubines uh, who, who he fathered at least six children with. And um, the, the youngest child, well, she had her first child with him when she was either 13 or 14. So let's just do the math. I mean, um, is it possible for us to call him any, you know, founding father, like literally, right? You know, but that, that's not something that we necessarily memorialize, right? You know, it's something where you kind of find, sort of find out if somebody told you, but it's not front and center. It's not front and center, right? In terms of what is it that we, re, re, we remember? And so, um, you know, apparently this idea for the monument was, uh, inspired by one of his lines about how we have to, uh, uh, you know, we have to, we have to continue to have faith that is hewn out of a mountain of hope, right? So that, that's the mountain in the background and, you know, him, him coming out, right? But, um, you know, the question is, is this too abstract? Um, is this effective as it is? Or what if, like the Thomas Jefferson Memorial, you actually had a full three-dimensional 
you know, portrait where you're able to actually walk around and appreciate all these dimensions. I mean, part of the reason why people save up all their money and fly to Florence, Italy is to marvel at, you know, the three-dimensional space, you know, that Michelangelo created with David, right? You know, complete with the veins. I mean, how do you, how do you have veins and arms, you know, out of stone? You know, I, how does it become lifelike like this? You know, and so, and so one of the questions, you know, I'm not, I'm not just being negative, but one of the questions is, when you look at this block-like type feature, does it make it actually, in some ways, ironically, more inaccessible, you know, to, to people? Because it's, it's not something that is practical as far as like an actual, you know, person that, you know, in three-dimensional space that I can appreciate, you know? Or is it the flip side where because it's so large and abstract, it becomes larger in my mind, you know, something that, you know, I want to, you know, respect, you know, and, and, and admire. Um, I think the jury is still out. Um, you know, uh, based upon, um, you know, the fact that it's still relatively new um, as far as, you know, being only, what, 10 years old or so. Um, I, I think, you know, we still need to see how people are reacting to it. But, but the point is that even in erecting a statue and in raising the funds, um, it still doesn't answer all the questions. I mean, there's still always, you know, a, a give and take over, you know, how do we go about remembering you know, people or ideas, because I think with with this concept with Dr. King, it's, it's a little bit of both, it's him as an individual, but also just the idea of he represented racial justice and also America finally, for the first time in public fashion, reconciled with this idea of moving forward with racial justice. I think that's going to be the fascinating part that you can explore, man. This representation is incredibly complex. You, you talked about several elements, and I think, you know, the fact that he represents this, he, he's, he's kind of like linked to the Lincoln Memorial in that, like, moral authority that we would like to believe that we've got and that we've awarded ourselves, you know, and, and that we like to look upon, you know, our better selves. So, you know, this is not all of the story, it's part of it. And I think that's the fascinating part about it. Dialogue about this, you mentioned dialogue in terms of, let's just say, uh, graffiti on the plinth, right? With, with Lee. Yes. Where does dialogue really take place around statues? I'm curious because, you know, there's, there's dialogue around every other art form you've shared with me so far. Where does this go? All I've seen is high-end art journal dialogue, or maybe a New York Times review of you know handy sculpture, things like that. Where does where do these conversations even happen in real life? You know, I'm talking you, like you and me now, outside of academia, though. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, um, I I think that that's maybe part of the the, the issue is that. Um, when a statute is out in the open space, um, there is less control of how these narratives are developed. And so in so many ways, it makes the symbology that much more potent in terms of how it can stimulate um, you know, various conversations and, and, and how the creators must be a bit more intentional in thinking about how something can you know, be interpreted or misinterpreted. I think when you're talking about um, because that, that's what I'm actually going to study. I'm going to specifically study statues that are out in public, you know, to the extent that you actually pay to see, uh, to, to go inside an actual building or a museum, th those are off my list because there's an express um, relationship that's created. I'm, I actually made it, you know, you know, express effort to go to this facility and go inside, you know, and, and, and they actually have more control over a narrative. They can actually you know, have more signage or they can have a tour guide that can explain, or even just in terms of how they're able to structure when and how I see it in terms of, you know, do I walk up a ramp, you know, is it around the corner, you know, just in terms of the lighting, they're able to, to frame that narrative more so and control it. But when it's just out there in public, I think that's part of a, the potential for spreading a message that is, is open and accessible to all, but also that's part of the difficulty um, in terms of how do you pick images or ideas that neither you know the the way the 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 fool or the wayfarer need not air, right? You know, so right. that everyone Ambigu can get ambiguous. Right, right, right. So that everyone can get it, right? And so going back to the whole uh, Lee on the on the horse piece, 
um, especially back in that time when horses were the main mode of transportation, it was pretty clear, right? You know, so he's up on a high horse. Oh, hats off to him. He's in charge, right? Um, that that was pretty clear. You know, I mean, there's no disputing. Even now, even when we're in cars, you know, this idea that if you're able to command a horse, oh, okay, I mean, that, that means something. You know, again, it's not like you're on your feet or you're on your knees, uh -huh. right? Asking for something, right? You know, clearly this was a some sort of person who at the very minimum thinks highly of themselves, right? You know, and they literally are higher. And so um, with this one though, I don't know if it's as clear, right? We know he's important. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting. He's like removed from the stone. Like, you know, is like, well, why is he removed? Like who, who removed him? Like, how did he get hewn out? Are, are there tools around? Like where are the tools? What were the tools? I mean, so th this is where the disconnect comes oftentimes between intent versus the impact, right? You know, of, the, of these type of symbols. And I think what's fascinating, you know, again, for whatever it's worth is how um, this is much more abstract than say the Lincoln Memorial that we talked about. You know, he's sitting in a chair, you have to go up the stairs and, and go meet my brother, you know, and you know, you got this like large, you know, 18 foot, you know, uh, you know, you know, sitting, sitting down. I mean, you know, we've seen it in movies, you know, I mean, is you know, and again, you're literally accessing the temple, you know, you know, with the columns. I mean, even just the, the structure that houses it is impressive. Yeah. And so that's a little less ambiguous, right? Jefferson in his own rotunda that's made an image of uh, Monticello, the, 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 port the portico that you see in the back of your nickel, that's a little less ambiguous, right? In terms of, okay. I mean, and also even the Jefferson statute is, is, is actually larger than human scale, right? You know, so, you know, in terms of this idea, and it's the only statue within that facility if you've been there, you know, so it, it's just impressive. You walk around, there's nothing else to look at except him. <laughs> right, you know, and so I mean th that eliminates a lot of questions. And then going back to the Lincoln piece, um, just for the record, I just want to state that he was ambivalent, by the way, y'all, on on the issue of uh, ending enslavement. A lot of people call him the Great Emancipator, but um, when he signed the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, that did not officially end slavery, enslavement. Enslavement officially ended in 1865 with the passage of the Thirteenth Amendment, not until December. Uh, so roughly, uh, what, eight months after the Civil War ended. Civil War ended in, in April. Uh, a week later, Lincoln was assassinated. No coincidence, right? And um, he said at his first inaugural address that um, if he had to free slaves, he would. But if he didn't, he wouldn't. His paramount objective was to save the Union. He was not laying up late at night, tossing and turning, thinking about, you know, poor, poor, Poor black people who are enslaved. That, 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 that's, that's not the case. But I, I think that might be the narrative that many people might get if they're just walking by the Lincoln Memorial, um, you know, with, without any context. But again, it is on the mall, you know, and, and, and I think that is significant in terms of the intention to, uh, you know, represent some sort of message. So, I mean, I, th I think that's, you know, something for us to continue to look at. Um, but yeah, uh, but but going back to what I was saying, just to be factual, uh, uh, the arts panel called original design confrontational. They asked for a less furrow brow, a softer mouth, and more detailed rendering of the hands. Interesting, right? Because remember, the last thing you want is a militant black male. Urgh, right? That's, that's, the, that's, the last <laughs> thing that's the last thing you want, right? A softer mouth. I don't know what that is, y'all. I'm to I'm to look that up. Right, I know. <laughs> That's right. I don't know either. <laughs> I'm going to look that up, um, and not to mention. Um, so here's the difference between the two, right? Subtle, but again, this is this is this is what people are going back and forth about for weeks and months. You know, I mean, it's a subtle difference, but you can tell. I mean, just a little bit, right? So you can see the eyebrow on, on the, the left a little more furrowed. The, the one on the right, you know, this idea he's a little bit more. I mean, and the thing is, like, but was George Washington like a party goer? No, if you go to Mount Vernon, you learn that George Washington was stentatorian. You know, he took his office so seriously. He hardly cracked jokes. He hardly smiled. He wanted to have people respect the office. So that's okay. But yet, Dr. King is serious about social justice. That's too much. And he can't, you know, he can't have a furrow. Bro. We, have, we have to, like, make him into a teddy bear where, you know, you know, he's all happy and singing Negro spirituals. Like, we shall overcome. I mean, I, I just don't get it. Like, I, I just want to be consistent. That's all. You know, it's just interesting, you know, how, how, how we're still fighting over this idea of image, you know, and, and what we want to remember. Not to mention, 
you see the word China to the right of the figure, uh, the live figure. Um, there was some controversy there as well because apparently when um, creating uh, the first monument to uh, an African-American on the Washington Mall, uh, the creators or designers were unable to find an African-American uh, in a nation of 330 million people with the artistic ability to create this statue. So they actually found an artist out in China to do this. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with employing artists from abroad. I'm just talking about similar to what I talked about with the Oscars. What does that mean though, just for African-Americans, right? I mean, this idea that I, I would like to think there are some African-American artists with the skill and ability who would have loved. I mean, I mean, this would have been the, the crown jewel of their, their life work, I'm, I'm sure. Like what an honor, I mean, to, to be an artist. I mean, first of all, just A, to be an artist, an African-American artist, right? You know, this idea that, you know, you're not, you know, working in, in, in corporate America and, you, you know, you had the fortitude to say, I'm going to pursue my art. And, you know, that, that takes a lot of strength. And then to be invited to, to honor one of the most famous human beings on the planet, let alone African-Americans. I mean, I, I would just like to think that there, there would be like a couple of African-American people who would like to line up for this. But, you know, just the idea that that somehow magically couldn't work out, you know, it just raises questions, right? You know, and again, am I being seen xenophobic? I don't, I don't know. I like to think not, you know, I like to think not. I mean, maybe I am. I mean, you know, I like to think not. But, you know, what's fascinating is like when I just think about other projects, like, for example, when they made the movie, um, what was it called? Churchill. You know, for some odd reason, Joe, they did not cast a white male from Wichita, Kansas in that role. Churchill, as in Winston Churchill. For whatever reason, they just did not find a white male from Winston-Salem, North Carolina, to play that role. You know, they magically, they, they found a British actor to play that role, just magically, right? <laughs> I mean, magically, that, that's how it worked out. And so, you know, when it, when it comes to <laughs> Dr. King, I'm just wondering, like, how come we could just not figure this out and provide an African-American an opportunity to give back to, you know, this, this beautiful legacy that, that he's created, right? You know, it's just fascinating the way that works. Okay. And so, um, you know, I, I can't believe we've been, we've been flowing like this for, for so long. Oh, my, get, oh my goodness. Uh, you know, so I, I, we have nine minutes before an hour has passed. So I want to just... Um, you know, a couple more pieces to put out on the table here. Um, one of the pieces I think is difficult for us is to reconcile with, because we no longer live in an era of enslavement, because no, one, no one's being whipped and being chained, that we still don't struggle with some of those ideas that helped foster the chains or the whips, All right? Because the whips are gone. It's like, well, Dr. G, what's the problem? The whips are gone. But what I'm suggesting is that some racist principles have been baked into the cake where, I mean, so for example, like Joe, like if you take this cake here on the right-hand side, can, can, I, can I cut you a slice? And then you're like, oh, Dr. G, you, you know I'm trying to cut back. Can you take the sugar out? I'm like, sure, Joe. Can I take a spoon and scoop the sugar out the, the, the slice of cake? No, it's, it's, already, it's already baked in. That's the point. It's already baked in. Yep. And I think that's sobering because a lot of people like to think, oh, Dr. G, well, you know, you're being negative. Like, we got, a, we got rid of the chains. We got rid of the whips. So we're good, right? Some concepts, Joe, some concepts, though, I think are baked in, right? Not all. You know, I'm, I'm not here to be negative, negative, negative. But some, I think, are baked in where it's just, I mean, you just can't scoop it out like that. It's just not that easy. And I think that's the hard part. And if we maybe acknowledge that, that will prepare us to do the hard work it takes to undo, you know, um, you know, some of what has happened, you know, in the past. So here's, here's where I like to land. Speaking of DC and where I'm going to be this summer, this is a statue that's still erected in DC. There were actually two. One was um, in um, Boston, but they took the one in Boston down, believe it or not, last summer as a result of the, the, the woke movement, okay? But this one is still erected in DC. Now, as you see with your own eyeballs, and you have four of them, haha. It says emancipation, right? It says emancipation. So meaning freedom, right? You know, we were liberated from enslavement. And as you can see, uh, the black male has coffles on his wrist, right? Symbolizing this idea that he was enslaved. And also we're acknowledging this idea that Lincoln 
somehow freed people. But again, going back to what I was saying earlier about the Emancipation Proclamation, um, the Emancipation Proclamation, to explain it in layman's terms, is the equivalent of the country of Vietnam saying today that anyone over the age of 40 will receive a $40,000 stimulus check this Friday. Sounds great. I would cash it in a heartbeat, but there's nothing for me to cash because it's not happening. What Vietnam does or says about what we should do has no bearing. They're just a foreign country. And so they, they, they can pass all the laws they want about what we should do, but thank you for the suggestion, but we'll take it from here. All right, you go back to your country, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll stay in ours. Uh, that is the exact equivalent of what the Emancipation Proclamation meant to the Confederacy. The Confederacy has seceded from the Union. A lot of people overlook this detail, meaning they had their own capital, their own president, Jefferson Davis. The capital was in Alabama. They had their own Confederate, I mean, they had their own Confederate um, currency, Joe. They were operating, I mean, so, so any military field order had no legal bearing at that time. So that's A. B, even more direct and succinct, uh, how about when Lincoln promulgated the Emancipation Proclamation, slavery was still legal in Northern states such as Maryland and Delaware. So in other words, he didn't free a hot dang single soul. But that being said, the narrative is, he's the bro that we think about when we think of emancipation, okay? I mean, that's just how it is. So it's, I mean, it's the narrative that has yet to be fully interrupted, except when they made that movie, uh, Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Slayer, whatever. So, um, Joe, when you look at this picture, though, what, what, what do you see, though, what, between the two individuals? When you, when you look at this picture, what do you see? Yeah, you've got a... <laughs> Have you seen yeah, this before? Yeah, I've seen... You, you've, you uh, showed us this in one of your uh, previous presentations. I, oh. you know, I, I do see the fact that you know, you've, they're, they're not on level playing ground. They're not standing eye to eye. You've got this position of almost uh, gracious benevolence that's being granted to a person who is, like you said, formerly ens enslaved. You know, mm -hmm. clearly unclothed. You know, it's 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 a disparity. It's a clear disparity. Uh, you get an A, gold star. Um, I concur with all what you said, and I would just summarize succinctly in four words. Free, but not equal. Yeah. I mean, the black man is free, but he's not equal. Like you said, he's, he's kneeling, not standing, not clothed. Lincoln is clothed, not in clothed, but he's clothed in a suit, you know, double breasted, you know, bow tie. I mean, he's looking nice and crisp. Um, when was the last time someone held their hand over your head? Uh, condescending, I mean, right? I mean, yeah. free, but not equal. Right, never since. I mean, you know, chains still on the wrist. I mean, what was there to celebrate here? But here's the point, though. This actually falls in the vein of what was very popular at the time. This is what we would call viral. Like, this is the equivalent of TikTok back then, right? Um, the pamphlet system was one of the, the, the cheapest means of distributing information, right? You know, we didn't have radios, we didn't have television, so the pamphlet system. So this is one of the most popular pamphlets back then. That was like that went viral. Am I not a man and a brother? So notice how uh, the person is kneeling, arms in supplication, asking, right? You know, am I not? So is, again, notice is this a stark contrast to see one of those what I would call comic book hero poses where chains are broken, right? You know, you're looking up at the individual, you know, like, hey, you know, I am a man and a brother, right? You know, I mean, it's not a declarative statement. It's like asking, am I not a man? You know, you know, you know so you can almost hear his voice quivering. Am I not a man? Right, that, that sort of deal, right? So um, the idea was this uh, was not only supposed to uh, appeal to the, the Christian ethos, uh -huh. right? That we're all brothers and sisters in Christ, right? You know, that idea. But also it was to appeal to the prevailing narratives of power and control this still did not challenge the prevailing idea of power right where whites were largely in control so i'm asking you if if i'm a man or a brother as opposed to me looking you dead in the eye and telling you like oh no i, I I'm, I'm a man you need to you need, you need to fix this 
or, or I'm or I'm gonna fix it. Like, oh, 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 oh whoa, time out. Like, what's the problem? Hold up, calm down, calm. You know, that's what they did. Because remember, they literally created black codes in the aftermath of um, you know enslavement, whereby it was against social southern etiquette. They called it for a black man to look a white man in the eye. Yeah, so, but here's my question. I mean, if, if you're so big and bad and you're what they call the master race and you make all the laws and rules, what, what, what are you afraid of? Like, if I look you in the eye, what, what, what are you challenged by? Like, I mean, what, what, what's bothering you? You know I mean? If, you, if you're in control, you know, if, if, you, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you're in charge, you know, me looking you in the eye shouldn't challenge you or take away any of your authority, you know, right. if you truly are a person of power. But, I mean, this is how society was operating right under these false pretenses so in context though these pamphlets wouldn't this pamphlet have been written by a white man who is probably a christian abolitionist who's trying to twinge the conscience of other white people whether they held slaves or not to kind of show their hypocrisy wouldn't that have been the intention to like draw a white person who had never even considered this fact as being a moral issue of conscience and of, of, of sin in their life, so to speak, at the time. So I'm with you except for that piece of hypocrisy. So the, the, what, what I, I think the appeal was we should not enslave these people because they're Christian too. But when we get into heaven, whites go first. I mean, I mean, I know it sounds bizarre. I know it sounds bizarre, but that was literally the thinking. Like, but if we go, but we, but if we go into heaven, you know, yeah, white whites would just go first, and then blacks can follow. Um, mm -hmm. you know, there's still a hierarchy at play, um, and uh, you know, I think one way in which I might be able to explain this better is through uh, this picture that I'm about to show you. Uh -huh. um, you know, and you know, before we land the plane. Uh, with, with the uh, black statutes. Uh, what do you think about this picture? Have you seen it before? <laughs> no, I haven't. I know that religion has been uh, used in service of many, many other causes. But Joe, I mean, isn't this, isn't this like deliciously ironic? Remember, I love, I, I love the Lord. I love the Lord. I just hate <laughs> N-words. Right? I love the word. I, I love the Lord. I just hate N-words. Yeah. Wow. Like, wait, like, wait, 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 which one is it? <laughs> wait, which one is it? Jesus saves. OMG. But yet you're going to burn a cross? Right. A sacred symbol? How profane is that? Exactly. So, no, Joe, so that, that's the only thing I, I, would, I would just, you know, tweet your piece about is that there still was a very clear uh, dichotomy in terms of the hierarchy, right? Yeah, no, the power dynamics I, I get. And I think that'll be really interesting to hear back in a few months or longer, whenever it is, but hear back about what you what you found. And, and you know, you mentioned a couple different things that I thought were fascinating. The fact that it does take time, money, and, you know, these permanent monuments are built with specific goals in mind. And y clearly, there's a political element. If they're in the public square, it is politics. There's going to be politics within that somehow. Yes. That, that'll be, I, I can't wait to hear a little bit more about what you found and what, you, what, what your thoughts and synthesis is. Absolutely. No, well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited to find out as well um, because for me, it's just goes along with this idea that Joe, I think we, in many ways, we've only just begun to have this conversation, you know, because uh, um, I think there are so many messages that are all around us. Um, many times we digest them whole um, without, you know, consciously thinking about them. But I think all we want to do is just recognize the full story, tell the full truth, and be able to be in a position to appreciate our full humanity by thinking critically you know, more intentionally about you know, all the pieces that, 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 that go into the puzzle. And hopefully by us being able to do so, we will finally be able to reveal 
that which is hidden in plain sight. Well, Dr. G, thank you very much. Do you have any final conclusion here? Or, or I, I just gotta say, we've been richer for this discussion, for your presentations and the time that you've spent with us. And I thank you. And I hope that we have the opportunity to engage in another series down the line. So I won't say so long, Joe. Um, I will simply say to be continued. Sounds great. Take care.